Welcome everybody. Welcome to our 12 o'clock webinar on the Devon Living Churchyards project. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot of really useful practical information in the next hour. Uh, if this is the first of our webinars that you've come along to, we've got a whole programme this week. We've got 12 different webinars that have been going on from Monday to Friday afternoon, all themed around land and nature. We're running them this week in parallel with Churches Count on Nature, which is happening all around the country as we speak. So more than 300 churches around the country have registered to take part in Churches Count on Nature and go out into their churchyards and their green spaces and, and count and record the fabulous plants and insects and birds that they find there. And all of that information is going to be uploaded onto the National Biodiversity Network and we'll know so much more about the wonderful ecology of our churchyards. Nationally, we've run this webinar programme all about land and nature to try and help people understand these issues and know what they can do locally. In terms of the boring but important housekeeping, uh, we're using the Q&A for questions rather than the chat. So if you move your mouse around, you'll find the Q&A. That's where you can type in your question. You can see other people's questions and click the thumbs up next to the ones that you think are most interesting. And when David has finished speaking, we'll use that bit of time at the end to start from the top of the questions, the ones that are the most popular. Uh, once the webinar finishes today, this afternoon, I'll send you round the slides. I'll send you any links that are shared in the chat and I'll share you a link, uh, send you a link through to our feedback form. Uh, so please do take notes, but don't worry, the slides will be coming. And we're also recording all of the webinars. And if you give me a few days, they'll end up on our website on the same webinars page where you book. <coughs> them. I always begin with the uh, previews of upcoming attractions. So the rest of the webinars we've got left this week. This afternoon, we've got one on Eco Church, specifically about the land and nature section of Eco Church. And they'll be full of practical examples of how churches that have um, moved forward with the Eco Church framework have got their awards and how the, what they've done in terms of land and nature. We've got a beginner's guide to biodiversity and ecology tomorrow. And then the final webinar is about biological recording and the beautiful burial ground project. So if you've been going out making readings in your churchyards, but you're not sure how to upload that information, please do come along and you'll find out everything you need to know. And then on Saturday, Sheffield Diocese are hosting an online eco church festival uh, linked in with Churches Count on Nature. When I finish speaking, I'll put the links to the webinars page and the Sheffield event in the chat. And then looking further ahead into July, we've got our uh, webinar on the basics of heat pumps, a little bit different from land and nature, but a very important topic. We've got three different eco church webinars on getting started on maintaining momentum and net zero carbon. And then in September, looking ahead to after the summer, we've got two sessions on environmental fundraising because we know that's such an important issue for people. Where is the money going to come from? So there's going to be one session on what the opportunities are for environmental fundraising and one on how to go about doing the fundraising. Right, uh, let's get on to the main event, which is to hear from David. So um, David is the Exeter Diocese Environmental Advisor and he manages the Devon Living Church Arts Project and also the chair of the Devon Church's Green Action Group. So he absolutely knows what he's talking about today. You're in very safe hands and I'm sure you'll learn a lot from him. Uh, and if you haven't come to one of our webinars before, I'm Catherine Ross and I'm one of the staff who runs the National Church of England Environment <laughs> Programme. I'm based in the Cathedral and Church Buildings Division. Right, enough from me. I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to David to lead us off. That looks like it's working successfully. Top left, slideshow from beginning. There we are. Hey. Perfect. You're away. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've been working with one form or another on living churchyards for about 25 years now, 
both in Hertfordshire, where I used to work for 25 years, and I've come back to my own uh, town, uh, Plymouth in Devon. Right, let's go ahead. Oh, by the way, um, I don't know if you're familiar with God's Acre, the term God's Acre. When the Saxons built their churches, um, they were allowed to put graves around the church, but only to the size of an acre. And an acre in those days was the amount of land the farmer could plow in one day. So there were no specific measurements. It was the amount of land that a man could plow in one day. And so around the church, you had an acre of grave, gravestones and memorials. And this was called God's Acre. So that's where that comes from. Now, as you see from the slide, according to latest, latest statistics, there are 10,000 churchyards in the UK. So, the, I mean, that's a small national park just about. And there are 625 churchyards in Devon. They range from the highlands of Dartmoor. And here we've got St. Michael's Church at Brentor. And on the other side of that church is a graveyard with about 60 graves in it, very high up. To the very lowlands of uh, Devon from the River Tavy, we have here St. Andrews at Bear Ferrers. So we have a large range of different environments from which our churchyards exist. And of course, we have the urban environment as well. Uh, on the front there, you see the Plymouth Unitarian Church. They've done some wonderful landscaping. This is a major uh, town through town. So, you know, it's quite an urban spot and um, they've done a lot of work there on landscaping. And then at the back on the right hand side, you see St. Andrew's Church, which is the main church of Plymouth. And um, Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do much on that yet because it is St. Andrew's Church and there are small patches of grass and things like that. That's to come. Now, this is very important to remember. A churchyard is many things to many people. So when you deal with a church and you deal with the people, you have to remember there are some people who think that a churchyard is a pleasant, reflective place for the congregation and visitors. Some will think it's an environment in keeping with the function of burial and the scattering of cremated remains. Some will have think that it's a respected and cared for part of our environment. And some will think it's a sanctuary for wildlife. So there is a mixture of people there and they all got their different attitudes towards how a churchyard be used. And this will be one of your main functions, I think, when doing this is you have to satisfy a lot of different people. Now, of course, the first thing we see when we go into churchyards is graveyards, memorials, and there's a wonderful assortment of stone geology, which in itself is a fascinating subject. Um, that big one at the back is um, of granite from Northern Ireland and uh, Scottish granites and all sorts. And you can see here, there are Scottish granite, Cornish granite, Swedish larvacite, Portland stone, Italian marble, York stone, and they've all got their different hardnesses and all got their different characteristics. So if you ever wanted to start teaching about geology, the best place you can go actually is in a graveyard. This is at Buckfast Abbey, which is in uh, South Devon. And you can see there, there are two major stones. You've got the limestone, the blue limestone, which is very characteristic of Buckfast Lee. But on the left, around the door frames and that sort of thing, you have Ham Hill stone from Somerset. So when the monks built the, the abbey, they imported stone from Somerset. And you just need to think about the implications of that in the way of transport and so on. This is St Albans Abbey, uh, where I used to work. I was on the Abbey Environmental Committee. And around the base of the abbey are 13 Hertfordshire pudding stones. This is a unique stone. You can't find it anywhere else in the world. But it's also associated with many myths and legends going back to medieval times. And you'll find a number of houses in St Albans, especially the old part of St Albans in St Michael's, which have large lumps of pudding stone outside the front door. And that was to keep the witches away from the house. So when you think around the abbey here, we have 13 pudding stones been placed 
within the brickwork of the abbey to keep the witches away. <laughs> but uh, again, interesting storyline. And this is from a lovely church in uh, East Devon. I mean, look at the geology that's within that church. You can see the, the current bedding on the wrong pillar there and all sorts of features and, uh, and beer stone. So you can guess where the church is from. Um, it's, a, it's so interesting. So please don't ignore the geology. Find out what your church is built from and find out where the stone's from and you can get some real good um, information on that to work on. And of course, on the memorials, we have lichens. Average on about 40 lichens in each churchyard. Some I've known have had up to 100 lichens. We did a survey at uh, one of our churches in Devon uh, earlier this year, and uh, it's Ken, a place called Ken, K E W N. And there were two lichens discovered there which are of European importance. So please don't ignore your lichens. There is the British Lichen Society. If you'd like to try and find out who is your local British Lichen Society recorder, ask them in and ask them to do a lichen survey. Now you see half the word there, problems. I was at a churchyard a few months ago and they had had a request from the local history society to record the grave headstones as a, as a system of archive to find out more about the history of the area. But of course, many of the engraved stones had the lettering concealed by lichens, so they were difficult to read. So they would bring in a bucket of water and bleach and a good scrubbing brush so they could scrub off the lichens to read <laughs> the inscriptions on the gravestones. <clears throat> that has been quite a problem in many churchyards. And you just have to go up and very nicely speak to the historians and say, I'm sorry, I'd be rather you didn't <laughs> for obvious reasons. And uh, we've been okay so far. But there you are, just because you think they're there and they're safe, they're not necessarily safe. Or you may have somebody in the church itself who thinks that these things are untidy and will scrub them off the gravestones. That's happened. The thing with churchyards is they reflect the abundant wildlife of the countryside around them. Now a churchyard is usually 800 years old. Then 800 years ago, they put a wall around it. Think about that. Take a piece of, let's take a piece of heathland, put a wall around it, and then doesn't matter what happens outside, you build a town or whatever, you've still got that piece of heathland within that wall. And so the, the DNA diversity has been in that soil for 800 years. So if you like, a churchyard is a window to the past. I think it's a nice way of putting it. And this is why churchyards are unique. And if only they just let the grass grow in certain areas, we could look through that window and see what was there. It could have been a heathland, a moorland, a meadowland, a woodland glade, anything. And so this is why churchyards are so important. We've got the word there of islands of refuge as well, especially in the urban environment. There are no oasis in the middle of a town, so they have an important role to play. Is this your churchyard? I hope not. <laughs> you see there, the grass has been cut to within an inch of its life, and every year that churchyard, the, mass, the grass is grown Think of the cost. I had a vicar come up to me last year and said, do you know I spend 1,200 pound a year on cutting the grass in my churchyard? And my question was, why? <laughs> why? Why do you need that? And the response was, well, it looks tidy. And it's also a respect for the dead as well. Um, another case in point where I went to a churchyard and they let the grass grow along and there was a, um, some um, apartments next door for, um, for elderly people. And they went, they, were got, they got quite angry because it looked so untidy and disrespectful to the dead. And I'm going to phone my NP and get it changed. Again, people's attitudes were always dealing 
with different attitudes to what a graveyard is for, what a churchyard is for. On the other hand, if you go to Throwley Church, you have this lovely mix of wildflowers. Or St Andrew's Church at Bear Ferrers. There's rowan trees there and wildflowers throughout the churchyard. And they're mown just four times a year. Or whenever, whatever flower come up, you can actually assess then when to mow the grass. So not mowing the grass is an important aspect of increasing biodiversity in the churchyard. But on that, there are a number of problems of attitudes, people's mindsets and so on. And uh, it's quite a battle, believe you me. Yew trees, most churchyards have got yew trees. And I think we need to remember that usually churchyards, when Christians first came into this country, they would find pagan sites and they would establish a Christian church on that site. Yew trees were very, very prominent in pagan beliefs. And so whenever they found yew trees, they were to build a church next to it. So many of our churches have yew trees, very old yew trees. Um, I went to a church uh, a couple of years ago where there was a spring causing annoyance in the graveyard. And I said, look, don't you think that in fact, this is a reflection of the pagan site because springs were sacred, wells were sacred, yews were sacred. So just think about that when you look at your church and um, we have there a number of yew trees and take in Devon, for instance, there is a town called Heavy Tree near Exeter. Heavy tree, if you like, heavy tree. And then if you look at a photograph of the church, you will find a very, very large yew tree, a heavy tree outside the church front doors. So um, there's this historical significance in this. And many of our yews are sometimes are above 500 years. Some, in fact, can be up to 2,000 years. So churchyards are very, very important places for yew trees. Now, this is the Conservation Foundation uh, project in the millennium when they took seeds from a very, very ancient yew, something like 2,000 years old, and they grew those seeds into young trees, yew trees, and they distributed those yew trees throughout the country. And this is one here, which I've had in um, one of our model churchyards, if you like, in Plymouth. <clears throat> churchyards may be the last refuge for grassland fungi in some parts of England. Yet churchyards, churches are often placed in grasslands. So we had all the grassland, meadow flowers, all sorts of things, and fungi, ants, nests, all sorts of things. So if you do find wax cap fungi, it's an indicator species. Churchyards are also ideal places for bumblebees to find nests and food. And that, at this moment, is a very, very important aspect of churchyard conservation, because our bees, our pollinators are declining, bees, Wasps, butterflies, insects are all declining. So we need to increase flowers in our churchyard to help the pollinators. Here's a new twist on it. Um, they're establishing a, a, a beekeeping project in North Norfolk. And here in Plymouth, and one of my model churches, this is St. Edward's Church in Plymouth. And there, the local beekeeper has been asked to establish two beehives. And of course, from beehives, you get the honey and wax, and they can sell that in the church and uh, make the funds available for more project work within the church grounds. Um, people will start screaming about safety issues. Well, get the local beekeeper along and let him decide where to put the, the hives. We can help in our churchyard quite easy by putting up bee or bug hotels, if you like. And you can see there, there are two. One on the left is homemade and the one on the right is commercial. 
Um, there's one built by the uh, children in the church. Note the name of its place, Buckingham Palace. And in the spring, that is packed with insects of solitary bees, community bees, honeybees, all types of insects. So I would encourage anybody, one of the first jobs they do is put a bug hotel within their churchyard. This is just a sandy bank. I'm standing, taking the photograph um, in a, a, a sunken path, if you like. And there's a sandy bank coming up from the, uh, the stone wall. But if you look at that bank very carefully, you'll find holes about the size of a pencil going into that bank. And that bank is stuffed full of solitary bees. So if you've got little banks like that around your church or paths, have a careful look at them during the summer months and see if they are being used by bees. And if they are, when the winter comes, you can very, very gently scrape away some of the vegetation to expose more soil for the bees to use in the coming years. So don't ignore your, your sandy banks within the churchyard. We work with um, Devon Local Nature Partnership and we are part of the Get Devon Buzzing Scheme, raising awareness of the importance of pollinators and taking positive action to conserve them. I found this on the website. I, I, I don't know who did it, but um, a lovely notice. Pardon the weeds, we're feeding the bees. And that brings me on to a subject too about notice boards, which I'll say more about later on. Here's a very large churchyard I've been working with in Hatherley in Oakhampton, just north of Oakhampton. Of course, it's all very well letting the grass grow long, but when a relative of somebody who's deceased visits their grave and they have to hack their way through waste deep grass, of course, they are not at all happy about it. And, and understandably so. And so what we've done in Hatherley is we've gone and mapped the areas are used by relatives visiting graves against those areas which are not being used for anything. So we got the orange area, and we got the blue areas, and the grass is cut accordingly. Where you see village square there, it's always best to have an, a nice view from the gate to the um, church entrance. <clears throat> so it's always good to keep partly mown grass there, you know, go in two meters and just mow the grass all the way out to the door. And don't forget the wedding ceremonies at your church as well, because they love to stand in front of your church on a lawn uh, with trees behind or whatever. So when you start looking at your grass cutting regime, find out where the wedding photographs are taken and then manage that accordingly. Many churchyards are very old ants nests and here's one here. Um, that's an indicator again that this is old grassland. So the church was built on meadow of some sort. And that, goodness knows how long that nest has been there. And we must remember it's like a, a glacier. Nine tenths of that nest is on the ground. Six months ago, I had a call from a local church where the vicar had a letter um, of complaint that there was an ant's nest covering a child's grave. And so the person who wrote the letter said, so I tipped a tin of ant powder all over it to kill them off because it's disrespectful to that and strike one colony. Um, I phoned that person and talked to them and talked about the value of the ant's nest and promised to trim the ant's nest, if you like. But um, yeah, it just took a good discussion and he was sympathetic. But those are the sort of problems you're going to come up against. Um, and they're very important to address. Plant a, I mean, if you've got no room for anything else, plant a pot, pollinators. A good list there. Look up any site, look up the RHS pollinator site, and there's a lovely list of pollinator plants, both garden plants 
and wild plants as well. I've been, it's sometimes very frustrating because of the lack of grass in the churchyard to, in a, to encourage meadow flowers. So I had a thought, well, why not produce mini wildflower meadows? So we looked for an old grave, which as you can see there. We scraped off the top, took all the weeds off, scraped it right down to bare soil, and then spread a packet of wildflower seeds across that. And the next year, sure enough, your, your wildflowers started growing. So instead of having one big area of grass sward, you can actually select these mini wildflower meadows in the graves and spread them throughout your churchyard. And the site is well worth it. Swifts are an important aspect of our churches. Um, and it's been, it's been quite, I've uh, been quite happy, unhappy. I talked to a colleague yesterday, he was the same. I saw my first swifts yesterday. You know, I mean, I should have seen them three or four weeks ago. Uh, they are declining very rapidly indeed. So the need for nesting sites becomes even more important. And swifts come back to the same nest every year to breed. And 5% of them, they'll nest in churchyard towers. And the swift is on the amber list for endangered species. Now, once you start talking about doing things in churchyard towers, you start thinking about heritage value of the tower, screwing in screws, nails, faculty, and so on and so forth. Here we can see some churches have been doing things about it. They've been installing various swift next boxes, which you can either make yourself from plans on the uh, website, or you can actually buy them. This is Chagford Church, one of my sort of prize examples of living churchyards. You can see the grass is growing there with lovely wildflowers. And in the church there, up, up in the tower, you can see the, um, the windows there, and behind those are nest boxes. And there's also a loudspeaker as well, which plays swift soundtracks to attract the birds, and successfully too. If you're wondering how you can install Swift, so here is, um, oh, it's not too bad, I can see it, but these are plans for a Swift, ne uh, a Swift nesting cabinet for a belfry by a chap called Bill Murrell. I've got the PDF if anybody wants it. And the thing about this is that there are no nails or screws used. It's installed by an, a bar, a, an extension bar, which is if it keeps it in by friction. Um, so there are no nails or screws lost. And you can see there, they're put right behind the louvre there. And they're off, always, always um, inhabited by swifts each year. But you will get much better chance of getting those in faculty if you say there will be no screws or nails or anything like that. And I have two churches this summer so far very interested in doing that and um, taking action to do this. This is my last job in St. Albans when I worked with the Abbey. Um, there were some works needed doing on the Abbey roof. And so I said, well, while you're up there, why don't you put up some nest boxes, swift next boxes, which they did. So they put in two swift or triple swift next boxes. And there is the poor archdeacon saying a prayer <laughs> over the nest boxes. Um, very nervously, I expect, but yeah, but they worked. And on this side, we have swifts nesting. And on the other side of the Abbey, there was peregrines nesting as well. So we had best of both worlds. I'm sure the peregrine had the best of both worlds as well. <laughs> this is happening a lot this year. I've had a number of calls from vicars and other people about swallows nesting in the south porch. Lovely, it's lovely to see that, but of course, with the nest comes the swallows droppings and causing quite a, a mess sometimes. So there is a problem there in the bottom right hand corner there, you can see the, the droppings from the swallows. Um, all I can recommend is that they put a little shelf 
under the swallow's nest during the winter so that any droppings which fall fall on this shelf and not on the floor. But I've had three calls so far in the last month about uh, barn swallows nesting in the south porch. What can we do about the droppings? And it's just lovely to see the swallows. And when people come to church, they can look up and see the young sometimes um, looking out of their nest. Good question. Many churches where all the flower gone, they have been actually mown to an inch of their life. This is the type of view we like to see. It can be done and has been done. Again, where there is no room for flowers or plants, the local brownies group from the church um, had this raised bed built. This is uh, you know, the, the notice on the top, on the front there says, be happy. And those are pollinator flowers. Um, raised beds are a very good asset in churchyards because they're not affecting anything. And um, I like to encourage churches to put biblical herbs within a raised bed because um, obviously you've got the, um, the biblical reference there, but also you've got the pollinator value as well. But raised beds, excellent things to use in churchyards. We seem to take our daffodils and crocuses for granted every spring when we walk through our churchyard. And yet some of these were planted a long, long time ago. And some of these varieties, they just don't exist nowadays. So don't be um, apathetic about your daffodils and crocuses. These could be of a horticulture or a cultural heritage and um, it can be quite valuable. Of course, veteran trees are going to like a place for churchyards uh, to be. Um, this is a 13th century sketch of St. Peter's Church in St. Albans. This was 2015. In front of the church there, you see a, a massive cedar of Lebanon. It's past its sell-by date. And when it's past its sell-by date, it tells you by dropping its lower limbs, very large lower limbs. And underneath, you see graves. And sometimes people could be visiting. And uh, so you have to be very careful with that. Top left-hand corner is a very, very old horse chestnut tree. And to the right, those very tall it's a Douglas fir, twin-stemmed Douglas fir. Um, that blew over one February, and I'll show you what happened later on. Again, in anticipation of this dying Lebanon cedar, we decided to plant a new one, younger one, um, 50 yards in front of it. So we stepped out 50 or 50 meters. And um, the local history society in St. Albans very kindly offered to buy a new young plant for us. And there you can see we were, we were digging the uh, plant and uh, we'll be plant and then have planted this new cedar ready for when the old one dies. There'll be something to take its place. And don't forget that. Don't wait for your trees to die. Do some forward planning and see how you could replace that tree later on. And that's there is a, a lovely Lebanon cedar. That, by the way, was 300 quid <laughs> for that tree. Um, here's another modern aspect of churchyard use, and that's edible churchyard. I've done two in Plymouth recently, and I've planned an urban church, an edible churchyard. So instead of putting pollinators, they've put it if you like a, a small allotment, if you like. And the food which is grown from there helps to supplement their food boxes because they give out food boxes every week to the local community. And then I had a call last year from a St. Paul's church in Paynton who has this very large, it's not a graveyard, it's just a spare piece of land. And they are planning to put an allotment plots all the way down there and encourage people to use those allotment plots. And the produce from those allotment plots will be used to supplement um, fruit and veg 
for their boxes, which they give out each week. So there's another interesting aspect of a churchyard, an edible churchyard. For you birdies, there's um, a lovely uh, bird which you often see. If you just go and stand in front of a hedgerow in a field sometimes and just watch, you'll see a bird fly out, grab an insect and fly back in again. Invariably, there'll be a spotted flycatcher, and it's the same in church graveyards as well. You'll we'll often see a, a spotted flycatcher fly out from the hedgerow, grab an insect, and then fly back in again. Um, so we like to encourage them. And so what we're doing there is we're working with the Devon Birds organization and we're doing a nest box scheme. So we've got the spotted flycatcher. So what we've done is chosen the churches around the edges of Dartmoor where the, uh, the spotted flycatchers are more frequent. And a number of churches have established nest boxes to encourage spotted flycatchers and some very successful as well. Sparrowhawks, very common. They just sit on the tower looking down for pigeons and goodness knows what else. So there's another important aspect. Just don't look down. Check your church tower um, with a pair of binoculars. And there we can see with a, a very old um, subject is the RSPB with their peregrine falcons on top of their church towers. This is Chichester. Norwich does the same as well every year. And some churches have actually put in nest boxes or nesting trays for peregrines to nest. You can invite people along, you can supply binoculars and things like that, have a little um, coffee table there and refreshments and that sort of thing. And just invite people to come in and have a look at the peregrine's nest. Hedgehogs, do you know they're threatened with extinction? Yes, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle has been threatened with extinction in the next 10 years. So habitat loss is the main cause. So this is where churchyards again become extremely valuable. And we know now that hedgehogs use churchyards more than we actually realized. So do keep an eye out, especially when you're mowing grass. And especially when you're looking at piles of um, twigs and that sort of thing. Do please look after your hedgehog population. Top predator, cats. They are the ones that do the most destruction in the churchyard. I think they say cats can um, get rid of about 3 million birds a year on average. Churchyard at night is just as interesting as a churchyard by day. And currently there's a bat's in churches project. And bats, as you can see, have been found in 6,000 churches and old churchyards throughout the UK. And this is a unique project. And what they're doing is finding out just where they are and then advising churches accordingly what they can do. And you must remember that bats are protected by law. And so therefore you have to be very careful what you do. Um, the positive thing to do is to put bat boxes um, throw the trees in the churchyards and do bat walks. I do often do bat walks through churchyards at night. And um, you can borrow a bat detector from your local county wildlife trust or ask somebody from the county wildlife trust to lead a bat walk for you around your churchyard. And you can finish them with refreshments and so on and so forth. And it's the same with birds as well. While I'm on the subject, um, do a dawn, uh, a dawn chorus watch and invite people out to your churchyard at dawn on a nice summer morning to listen to the dawn chorus. And then you finish it off with bacon butties and tea and so on and so forth. Here's the interesting thing that's been happening recently to a church. Somebody came down one morning and, and seen that all the turf had been disturbed around the church. And it was in fact badgers. And even last week, I had one church where a badger had, in fact, started excavating a burrow right next to a, a grave. Um, the first thing is to do is you contact your local county badger group because badgers are protected by law. 
Um, I, I don't give advice. I just put them on to the Devon Badger Group and who are qualified and experienced to advise on such um, events as this. Our nest boxes, this was in the, the All Saints Church in Oakhampton. That was successful this year. We had an owl breed and, and I think it was too young, finally made it. But other uses as well um, as focus spots for your community. Um, with the pandemic, churches have been closed. And so many churches have been holding their services when they've been allowed to um, outdoors. So the churchyard now is becoming even a more valuable space. It's also a space of quiet contemplation as well. So you can take a quiet corner of your churchyard in a seat where people can just come and sit quietly or you can get a group of um, willing helpers to come along and plant daffodils all the way along your church path so it's a very very important place providing a focus for health and well-being everybody walks past a churchyard because it is a churchyard <laughs> they never think of going in and we must try and this is why this week we're doing count on nature and love your burial grounds week to encourage people to go through that gate and have a look at what's inside the churchyard arosha uk run a, a lovely project called eco church and there are about i think there's more now for 46 records in Devon. And you are asked a number of questions about activities within your churchyard, which you can use for greening your churchyard. And you take these off and when you get 20 marks, you get the bronze. And when you get another lot right, you get the silver and so on and so forth. And then you get um, an award scheme with it. I do encourage it. Just look up Eco Church. Just Google it and please register. I practically every church can get the bronze quite easily. Silver is more challenging. Gold is more challenging. But I do recommend that you go for Eagle Church. Here's our St. Edward's Church again in Plymouth. They've got the silver award in Eagle Church. So they've had some challenging questions to answer about their activities within the church. And what they have, they have formed a green team within the church. And there you can see all those lovely smiling faces. We've been one spend so one day a month during the winter doing various management activities within the churchyard and church grounds and so on. So have you got a green team? Have you got a green champion? In Devon, we're trying to uh, persuade churches to propose a green champion. So we can write to that person instead of um, bothering the vicar or the church warden or whatever. Let us have your green champion, a person who you can write to, and they can pass on various messages and events and things. So we're looking for a green champion, and we're hoping that that green champion will set up a green team within the church. This is a more recent uh, project. This is the same thing as a Russia Eco Church, but it's for people, households, families to care for God's world. Have a look at have a look at the website, Creation Care. Storytelling, that's something we're losing in this modern day age. Top left hand corner there, storytelling into a churchyard and telling stories. They could be historical, they could be religious, whatever. And one important aspect is a storytelling seat. And I did one um, when I was in St. Albans District Council on the bottom left-hand corner there. Um, it was expensive, but look at it, it's beautiful. You've got an owl on the left arm, a badger on the right arm, and then you've got a little squirrel scuttering along. And that was just made from the trunk left over from a dead tree. And we can use it as a storyteller seat. If you remember in St. Albans Church, there was that lovely Douglas fire with twin stems. 
fell over. What on earth are we going to do with the timber? So I immediately contacted colleagues in the Faculty of Art in Harps University. And I said, do you have any budding wood carvers around? And it so happened they did. He was Hungarian. His grandfather was an Hungarian forester um, many, many, many years ago. We taught him skills. And so being faced with two very large trunks, he converted the trunks into a storytelling seat, a storytelling platform. And then where I'm taking the photograph behind me is a semicircular um, shape of seats for people to sit on. Wonderful, full use of anything. But storytelling is so important, especially if it's done in costume. So please remember, if you've got a chance to put a storytelling seat in your church, I do recommend it. And here's a couple other features as well. I'm coming to the end of my talk now. Um, when you have cremated remains, you usually got a little concrete um, or limestone or whatever stone plaques on the surface. And in this church, we were running out of space and we thought, well, where on earth are we going to put them? A challenge. So again, I went to colleagues in the art faculty at Harps University. I said, what I need is some way for people with cremated remains to be able to notice and remember their relatives. And there was a girl there and she came up with this sculpture. It's a meter and a half high. And it's called the tree of life. It is chrome and each leaf is inscribed by a, by, you know, for a person who has got cremated remains in that area. So it takes away all that business of all those various plaques all over the floor. And they're all remembered on the tree of life. So don't forget art, sculpture in the churchyard as well. Top, top right hand side, orchard. Big space I had in the churchyard. What am I doing with it? Plant an orchard, of course. And I immediately got criticized because you don't have orchards in churchyards. <laughs> you do now. Um, and we put in 70 trees there and it's growing very well indeed. They're all five meters apart. There is fruits, apples, pears, plums, all of Hertfordshire varieties. So you're doing a heritage thing as well. And then the bottom right, very, very important is notice boards or interpretation. I've done a text for a notice board so I can give it to the, any church and they can make that into whatever type of notice board they want to. But here we had some money, amazingly. And so I went to colleagues at Fitzpatrick Walmer, who do major signage works for national parks and local authorities and that sort of thing. And they produced seven of these panels. They're practically um, uh, like you can't destroy them. <laughs> and the, and the sun doesn't affect the photographs in any way. They are expensive, but what you get is just amazing. So have a look at Fitzpatrick and Walmer whenever you want. Yes, they are expensive. Don't go cheap because they won't last long. If you want a book to read, Earth to Earth, A Natural History of Churchyards, came out last year. So do something small to be a part of something big, from feeding birds, providing nest boxes, to planting wildflower seed, to maintaining ancient trees and planting new trees, to leading health walks. You can do something in your churchyards at any time. And from John Stott, the late John Stott, a lovely verse, the Bible is a revelation of the grace of God. Nature is a revelation of the glory of God. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. You really brought home just the incredible variety, the incredible variety of birds and plants and fungi and trees that 
that are around us that we probably just completely take for granted and, and don't notice. And you've made us look at them with new eyes, I think. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we've got just a few minutes now for Q&A. So everyone listening in, if you find the Q&A, you can type in your questions there or you can put your thumbs up next to other people's questions. Um, oh, the first one that's there, David, is quite a quite a complicated question. I wonder if you have got any um, any insight. It's about problems with drugs use and drugs paraphernalia in church. Yes. So the question says, yeah. in my churchyard, there's a problem with drugs paraphernalia with an increase in the town with the number of needles found. Do you have any advice? Yeah, we had the same part. Our church at St. Peter's in St. Albans was right in the city centre. And in the churchyard, there was a row of the dreaded Leylandii tree. And the lower branches provided ideal shelter for drug users and so on. So all the paraphernalia was under these. So what are we going to do? How are we going to stop the drug users? Don't focus on the drug user. Focus on the place itself. And so I cut down 30 Leylandii trees so there is no longer any shelter. I mean, Leylandii are rubbish anyway. Um, what, what good is Leylandii? And it took away the problem. The problem wasn't the drug users. The problem was that they had somewhere to go. So before you start trying to attack the drug user, look at what they're using and see if you can modify that space. Because they're obviously using it for some reason. So look at the space carefully and see what you can do to modify that space. Is it sheltered? Is it you know overshadowed by trees and that sort of thing? So remove the problem, and or the space first. And it was, uh, it was very successful in St Albans. The next question is about faculty. Uh, oh. a question specific question is about: Do you need a faculty to plant trees? But there's probably a more general question about what you do and don't need faculty for. Um, I'll just find the link and I'll put the link in the chat through to the faculty rules. But if you start talking, David, and then I'll, whilst I do that. Yes, um, it's the Church of England thing. They don't have planning permissions. They've got their own planning regulations, if you like, and it's called faculty. Faculty is important, although sometimes a pain in the butt. But it is important to ring your um, officer, your DAC officer in your diocese and say, look, I want to do this. Do I need a faculty? Or you can go to your church or your diocesan, diocesan website and look up the faculty page there. And there are type A's and type B's. So those on list A, you have to get faculty permission for. Um, for instance, they've just moved bird next boxes now to faculty B. So you don't have to go to the problems now of applying for a faculty. You can just go to your archdeacon and say, I want to put nest boxes up here. Is it okay? But do take note and always make sure you check to see whether you need a faculty, the nest boxes, raised beds, bat boxes, whatever. If I just share my screen a second. <clears throat> So the link that I've just put in the chat is through to this page here on the with the faculty jurisdiction rules. Are those showing up, David? Yeah. Very good. So then if you go in here to and you, if you search for churchyard on the rules, you'll find the things that are marked as A. So the things on list A are things that you can just do as a church. There's a number of things here in the churchyard and then underneath you'll find the trees section which shows you what you can do under list A and then if you keep searching down you'll get to list uh, B and list B are the ones where you need to consult the archdeacon but you don't need full faculty and under here you've got for example um, bird boxes are in here somewhere aren't they I'll find those in a second but under trees the planting of trees is a list B item, so archdeacon rather than full faculty. And let me just search for bird. So bird boxes is here. The introduction of bird boxes is in list B. 
be under what section am I in? Oh, it's a very long section, church buildings. So if you want to know whether you can do something, just get on and do something, list A, permission from the Archdeacon list B, and if they're not in list A or list B, then that's when you need full faculty. And if you're ever unclear, then your Archdeacon or your local DAC secretary are the people to, to speak to. Right, the next question. Close the questions in order to look at that screen right here we go. Um, any top tips from your experience for dealing with opposing views on how a churchyard should look and be managed? I bet you deal with that all the time, David. So when there's people in the church community with different conflicting opinions, how to find a way through. <coughs> That's right. Uh, it is a problem. It is a genuine problem. And you have to be very careful on what you say and how you say it. Um, and it's just raising awareness. Talk to these people. And sometimes, most of the times, just by talking to them and telling them why you're doing this, uh, they, they, you know, they'll come around, so to speak. But it is a problem. People have different views. People think that they must have short grass in graveyards to keep it tidy. And you've got that word tidy. Tidy to one person is, is different to tidy for another person. But yes, it's just negotiation all the time. But the PCC has the last word. So you need to convince your PCC and even more your church warden of the way forward. There were, um, so the webinars we had earlier this week um, from Came for God's Acre, a very similar question came up. <clears throat> and one of the things that they, um, that Andrea spoke about was saying to people that the churchyard is like a Noah's Ark for wildlife and nature and um, that it's a, it's a safe place where you can protect yeah, nature. Yeah. And actually yeah. that language of talking about it as Noah's Ark can be a really good way of engaging. It is, yeah. yeah. And, and also your, the allegory of a window in the past as well. It's exactly, a window I love past. that phrase, a churchyard is yeah. a window to the past. Um, and another thing she said was to avoid language around rewilding and instead make it clear that you're actively managing your churchyard for people and nature and that yeah. it's that you are actively managing it you're looking after it you're not just letting it run wild and 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 i think that's come over from your webinar very clearly yeah. as well yeah. today david it's yeah. about this managing is, it actively for nature yeah this is where the notice board comes in very very important as soon as you start managing your churchyard put up a notice board uh, at the ch in the church notice board of whatever saying why you're doing it and I've got a set of wording for the rural church and the urban church. So instead of them wondering what to say, I just post it to them and say, put this up. Some put them into nice frames or some just put them up into the church notice board. Mm. But you must inform people why you're doing this. Don't start doing it and wondering why you get complaints. Uh Oh, then the next one is a lovely one. It says, uh, great stuff, David. You're an awesome asset to Exeter, Diocese and Devon generally. That's a lovely, lovely message. Um, and is it okay to share the link to your guidance notes in the chat? Right, that's something I didn't mention. Um, instead of trying to write things time and time again, what I've done is we've set up a series of guidance, what I call guidance notes. So if you're wondering what to do, how to manage your trees in your churchyard, we have a, a guidance notes on managing trees in your churchyard, managing the grassland, managing bats in your churchyard, managing lichens in your churchyard and so on. I think we've got about a dozen churchyards and I think they're on the Extra Diocese website. In fact, I'm sure of it. Lovely. So, so if you go to the Extra Diocese thing, if not, email me and I'll send them to you. Well, what I can do is because I'll send out an email after this is finished with all of the links from the chat. So if you send me those links, David, then I'll make sure oh, Chris Kepi has just put them in there as we speak. So I'll make sure that that link goes out to everybody with the follow up email. Or oh, now it is one o'clock, but there's only one question left. So if I'm allowed to keep you a couple of minutes, we'll answer this one as well, because then we'll have answered everyone's questions. Um, it says, thank you, David, for an inspiring talk. Many ideas. Uh, the, the, most of the churchyard is grazed by sheep, which of course doesn't help wildfire growth. If churchyards are in a conservation area, 
the local planning department has to be <laughs> consulted. So I guess that's not really a, it's not really a question. It's a it's a, a, a comment that says to consult <laughs> local planning departments if your churchyard's in a conservation area. Yeah, check that whenever you start a project, always check the status of your churchyard first before you start putting spades to soil and see where your church is situated. Um, your building may be grade two listed, but it also may include the churchyard as well. So check on that and then make the appropriate applications or it may be in the conservation area. So if you're dealing with trees and stuff, you really need to get to your local planning office um, and inform them on what you want to do as well. So do your homework first before you start doing anything. <clears throat> and sure. check also the legality. Um, you've got bats, bats are protected by law. Badgers are protected by law. Birds are protected by law as well. So just make sure you're up to speed with the legislation um, in your churchyard. Unfortunately, lichens aren't protected by law. Um, so again, it's just raising awareness of the importance of these plants. Fascinating plants. Mm. Get a magnifying glass and have a look. Go in really, really, really close into them those bright orange lichens on your church and see how they're, how they're built, how they're functioning. Um, yeah, your, fascinating. Uh, your, your knowledge and your love of, of nature has come over so strongly, David. Thank you so much for sharing your, sharing your knowledge today. Um, presumably, if somebody's joined this webinar from a Devon church, then they can contact you. <coughs> um, if they're not from Devon, I think their first point protocol would be caring for God's acre. Would that be correct? Caring for God's acre, or, or that's right. Yeah, that would be their best thing to do. Yeah, because they have a great vast amount of resources and instructions and all sorts of things. And um, they've been there and done that years before. So yeah, contact Caring for God's Acre. But if, but if, but you're, if, you're, in, Devon, if you're in Devon, David would love to hear from you. Ah, bird. Yeah. Thank you so much, David. I'll bring this to an end then. It's it's gone one and we've finished all the questions. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today for this webinar. I will save the links in the chat and I'll send you around an email this afternoon with the slides and those links so that you can follow up on all of that useful information. I do hope to that you will come along to one of our other webinars either this week or one of those ones further ahead. And uh, I, I wish you luck in bringing some of that beautiful nature we've seen pictures of today into your own churchyard. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank <clears throat> you.